Hello, hello, hello. Actually, the late Paul Lewis is now in the cloud doing machine learning. Pour one out for Paul Lewis. So here I am. Hello, Copenhagen. So I saw this bit recently, and I really wanted to try it on stage. So Bill Bailey did it, and what he did is he made the audience clap, but not clap like in applause, but only exactly once. So like, put your hands together exactly once in sync with this. Are you ready? What an amazing sound. <laughs> Nailed it. Okay. Enough time wasted. So, hey, welcome. This is uh, Supercharged, which we usually Surmacharged. do. Surmacharged. I'm rebranding because, as you know, this person is not the bald Paul Lewis. This I'm is wearing a hat, though. This is the, the boldest cap that I could find. It, Close enough, mm. maybe? So, Pull my colors. Monica luckily agreed to assist me today. And we're going to do the supercharged life, life, life as it is now, I guess, tradition. Um, but Paul did move on to DeepMind and is now working on basically on uh, Google Home and has been working on the next edition, which is going to be the Google Home Developer Edition, or as it's code named, the Chrome Home. And so we have a developer preview that we can hopefully show off a little bit today while we do our, our code bits. Mm -hmm. So it should be work pretty similarly as it usually does. And it, yeah, just. Do you want me to do it because your accent's kind of funny? Y yes, please. Mm. <clears throat> hey, Chrome Home, what's the weather in Copenhagen? Bleep. Uh, wait, wait, really? I'm programmed with the knowledge of 50 Chrome developers. I, I know all about web APIs and standards. And you're going to ask me the same stupid shit you'd ask a regular Google Home? Yes. <clears throat> OK. <laughs> the weather in Copenhagen is kind of nice. For further details, please consult your nearest window. Th <laughs> so thank you, Chrome Home. We're going to maybe make use of that later. We'll see. It doesn't seem that helpful. Might as well have I, a third I guess Lewis right has here. been spending his time very well. Um, let's do the thing we're actually here for. What is it? We're going to build something. Sweet. What is it? We are going to build custom elements. Because after all, this is the Polymer Summit, so I thought we should at least be using custom elements, although I'm actually not using Polymer. Well, but, can't, um, can't win at because can we, we, we were focusing on the other thing that you say was use the platform, so we're going to show you the low-level stuff. And I thought something that I have been encountering or noticing lately is that a lot of sites have, or blogs especially, have images like these. I have some images of Copenhagen on this test site here. And they load the images right away. Like you load the page and all the images are loaded. And that is actually pretty hurtful because when you look at it, you have like 1.4 megabytes for opening a web page. And maybe you just want to read the first paragraph and then leave. And that's not cool. Mm -mm. So I thought you would build like a lazy loading kind of custom. I'm element, lazy, I'm into it. Right? So I'm gonna stop you right there, Serma. Okay. So I would like this. I've Paul Lewis told me not to ruin his legacy, so we have to do some housekeeping here. We would love questions from you so that as Serma is banging on the keyboard, we can actually answer your questions because who knows what he's going to do. And because we don't have comments on the YouTube stream, um, please tweet with the hashtag supercharged. I will also be looking at Polymer Summit, but I assume you're just going to be tweeting about how awesome we are on Polymer Summit. So hashtag supercharged, ask all of your questions, and I will answer them, or the Google Home. Or forward them to me to distract me. You know the usual deal. If you've seen this before, you know how this works. But we don't have the YouTube chat this time, mm. so we are using the Twitters, which also, not Waldorf, Das Surma. You should totally follow us. It's totally worth your time. But don't tweet at us, because I'm not reading my Twitter. Just, just Polymer Summit and Supercharged. That's all I got. All right, Serms. All right, let's go. Do it. All right, so what I have here is a pretty empty website, but we have four images that I totally took myself in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to try to make them uh, lazy load. And just to show you what's going on, it is super vanilla. It's literally four image tags with four spacer diffs in between, and the styles are just 
the space or it's just a high, very high diff so that there's some space in between. That is literally all we got and everything else we're going to write right here, right now live so you can actually watch and ask questions and stop me if I'm being stupid. So instead of using the image tag, we are now going to turn this into our SC image because branding is important. It's our supercharged image tag. Mm -hmm. And to use those, we actually have to, of course, define that element. So we're going to include a new thing, which is called SC image JS. And that Make is your text bigger. Yeah? Like this? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, SC image JS. And now the usual dance where we go, OK, SC image extends HTML element, constructor super. There we go. Wait, but your constructor's not doing anything. Why is it there? It's just, you know, have an element at first. So now the images are gone because the SC yep. image element is now in use and we haven't done anything. So if we look at our thing, HTML element. This should be saying SC image, and that is because I didn't actually call custom elements defined. So my class was just existing, but it wasn't used. So I'm going to go with custom elements define SC image. SC image, I think. Is that, that how it works? Yeah. You shouldn't still see anything, but now it says SC image. Now we are actually having our own custom elements in place, and now we can start working with them. So, um, the first thing I want to do is make Custom Type elements by default are um, inline, display inline. And for images, we don't really want that. We want them to be blocks or nice and wide and fill the space. So we're going to use Shadow DOM to give this element some in inherent styles. You should make the text even bigger. Even bigger. Also, somebody asked, he is using VS Code, I believe. It is VS Code. Yeah. Uh, so let's create, create, oh, this is going to be tough. I'm going to close the sidebar. Uh, let's create a template. And the template gets some in HTML. And we're using some template tags. And in here, we have the style. And the reason I'm using a template is because instead of for every, in every constructor call, I could just be setting in HTML, but that always starts the parser, which I don't really want. So I'm going to use a template, which is much quicker to, to instantiate. So in here, I'm going to say display block because our element is supposed to be display block. In our constructor, I'm going to say attach shadow mode open. Can I answer a question from the live stream? So he didn't actually need to write the constructor. He wasn't going to add anything. But I think he knew ahead of time he was going to add other things. If you're only calling super, you don't need to define the constructor there. That is true. There. I do it anyway. It's just like muscle memory. Uh, just like, just because like sometimes typing. you want to add stuff. And then so now we can do a template content clone node node. True. Wow, this, this is a family show. <laughs> so let's close the console and hopefully we should say display blocks or elements are not display block. There's cool. still that no image. That was our demo. Thank you for coming. We're done here. That's it. Not quite. So let's see how we can load the image. The, again, what I wanted to do is to load them when they come into view. So, and there's a new, kind of new primitive on the web, which is called intersection observer, which allows you to, why don't you explain it? Intersection Observer is a thingamajig so that when you scroll a thingamajig into the view, the Intersection Observer says, hey, that thingamajig is into the view. You should do something about it. That was super and it's concise. it's really useful if you have like a giant block of text and an image at the bottom, and you really don't want to load that image until that image is actually in the view, because maybe it's never going to get in the view. So when it comes into the view, you're like, bam, show that thing. All right. Hey, I got a question for you. All right. Um, why is your template outside of the class? Because I don't want to recreate the template for every instance. It's just like there so for me to reuse. So it's going to be parsed once, and I can reinstantiate it every time when a new element is being created, which is super fast. Cool. I mean, un unless you're, if you're creating like a million images, this is actually going to make a difference. Most of the time it won't, but this is just a good pattern to adopt so you don't run into these kind of problems. Mm -hmm. OK, intersection observer. Let's talk about these. Um, you create an intersection observer. And you give the intersection observer a callback. And this callback is going to be called every time some of your elements change their state. And their state meaning being inside the viewport or outside the viewport. When they intersect with the viewport. Yeah, exactly. Hey, 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 Chrome Home, how do you say intersect with the viewport in German? What? Uh, um, sorry, the Serma module has not yet been installed. G Google it. Um. 
Intersector does ein Viewporten, Civil Play? Um, did you mean Hilfe, meine Badewanne brennt? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Well, that means help, my bathtub is on fire. Um, sorry, Google Play services has stopped. <laughs> God, it's not I'm, working I'm, I'm really not, well. I'm not impressed with no. Paul's work recently. It's been gone for like two months, but it's been doing. It's downhill. Um, so the callback gets a number of, gets, it's a callback that as a parameter gets a number of entries, and each entry is for different elements and how the state changed. So we're going to go through all these entries, and if that entry is intersecting, meaning it is currently inside the viewport, on the element, which is the entry.target, we are going to set an attribute which is going to be called full, which is meaning like it should now show the full version of the image. And that is pretty much all we're going to use Intersection Observer for. But whenever an element scrolls in the viewport, the attribute full is going to get set. And then we can react to that change with our standard uh, observed attributes that we know from the custom elements. So for that, we need our static get observed attributes, which is going to be the full attribute only. And since we only have that one observed attribute, our attribute change callback uh, doesn't need any parameters because we know it's just going to be the full attribute. And what we're going to do is, if it's already full, we're going to return because we're not going to load the image twice. Once is enough. And otherwise, we're going to create a new element, create element image tag. Image source is going to be this the source. And now I just realized I forgot that I should get some getters. So we are using this.full. While you're doing the getters, lovely question from the audience. Which browsers support Intersection Observer? And since I'm too lazy to Google it, hey, Chrome Home, which browsers support Intersection Observer? Uh, 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 it's uh, Edge 15, Firefox 55, Chrome 58, Opera 46, and Samsung Internet 5. That's actually pretty decent. Yeah. So it's something, there is a polyfill, I think. There is a good polyfill for it. That you wrote. What? Didn't you write it? Somebody I, else wrote I, it. I did the first version, mm -hmm. then I passed it on to other people who were much smarter than me. Nice. Um, but you don't need it, apparently, because that was actually a pretty decent support list. So most of the time, you'll be running without it. So you're doing two getters yeah. and setters for source and for full? I'm not doing setters, because I'm not going to. Don't get, set anything. Yeah. Pretty much. All right, so we're creating a new image. We are copying the source from our image to the actual image tag. And then. And the reason why we're doing that is because the moment you set a source on an image, it's going to start loading. You can't stop it from loading on that image, no matter how hard you try. Exactly. And now we're going to wait for it Train to finish stop loading. In that platform. And once it's loaded, we are going to shadow root, attach it to the image. That is actually not, that's that's not right. a pen child, right? Nice. All right. This looks pretty OK, I think. Let's give it a try. I'm sure I did something wrong. Where's my console? Nothing is happening, which makes sense, because I just created the intersection observer. I didn't use it anywhere, mm -hmm. which um, you know, might, might be helpful. So on connected callback, this is the second part of the API. So the intersection observer you create, you pass a callback in to know which code to execute when something changes. And then you have, the, have to call, uh, tell the intersection observer what to actually observe. So I'm going to call observe this, because we're going to observe the element itself. And because we are good citizens of the web, we are also going to do our disconnected callback and call unobserve. Nice. So now we're getting errors on line 13, which is totally what I expected. It's, oh, set attribute. I always dislike this. I only want to set the attribute, and yet I still have to say, Set it to an empty value. Or true, yeah. Or true, I Whatever guess. Whatever you want. But it just seems unnecessary. So let's do this. Backwards compatibility for you. I guess. Nothing is happening. Oh, because we are setting full, and then we're checking if full, which we just set, and therefore this is going to abort. This is not smart, so I'm going to just call it loaded. So we're going to have two, attribute, uh, two properties now, the full attribute and the loaded. Full is when it's supposed to be on screen, and loaded when it actually is loaded and on screen. So in this callback, when it's loaded, we're actually going to call this loaded is true. I'm not going to define, even define an attribute, because this is live, mm, and it's, it's going to work anyway, right? So let's see. Cool. I mean, it's a little bit big, so that's not 
But it's, the image is in here in the Shadow DOM, so that's to good. To be fair, you didn't set any styles, so it's going to be yeah, as big as it is. Yeah, let's change that, shall we? Uh, so our image in here, and this is what I love about the Shadow DOM, I don't have to do like complex selectors because it is scoped by the Shadow DOM anyway, so I can just go image and say with 100% and be done with it. Boom. And now the, the thing is, if you go to the network panel, only image A has been loaded with 265 kilo kilobytes. Once I scroll down, yes. the second one loads. Scroll down, that one. And this is, you know, in terms of data conservation for the user, this is much better because now they only actually download the data they actually have on screen. So does the intersection observer run on every pixel scroll? How does it actually work? Um, is it performant, at least? It is super performant. So I think, uh, as far as I know, if you, if you don't use the polyfill but have a native implementation of intersection observer, it hooks into the actual layout engine. So the browser can, is obviously the only entity that knows if something, something is on screen or not. And once it is on screen, it queues up one of these callback invocations. And those are dispatched in idle time. And that means it will, you will only get to process these entries if the browser has time to do so. So if you're busy encoding a GIF or whatever people do these days on the main thread, your intersection observer callback will be delayed until there is actually headroom to so do this. You're these not kind blocking of layout, you're not blocking paint, you're, you're not, not blocking your animation. Or scroll, it's great. So um, it can basically only get better because the most important thing really should be to be interactive with your, for your user. Cool. All right. Um, I'm going to answer some more questions. Is that OK? Is that how we do it? Is that You're doing pretty good, actually. So one of the questions is what if the image content is the Shadow DOM, can robots access it? So like these search bots. And they can if they run JavaScript. So this is the same question for SEO. And yeah, pretty much. That you saw. Uh, Surma, what does SEO stand for? Search engine optimization? Serve my engine optimization? Serm engine optimization. I like Perfect. it. Um, yeah, so as, as you saw, exactly the same answer as in the SEO talk are, are from here. Um, if you're running JavaScript, it will be accessible it in there. Be fine. And also, you should probably set some alt. We're not doing this because it's not oh, live, it's not production. I should be setting alt, but, but that I, image doesn't have an alt. Rob Dodson is probably in the audience and he's not impressed. Punch me. Yeah. Please don't punch us. Because I was on his how to I'm on his how to team and I didn't do the accessible bit. I'm yeah. actually bad. Okay. I mean, that is pretty cool. This is working. We could say we're done, but there's something else. If you start on the if you scroll down and read out the page and scroll up, the images kind of pop into existence because at the start our image has no height. And then it, once the zero height diff comes into view, the image is on suddenly it has a mm. height, so they kind of <coughs> appear. Which is really sad. So what I would like to do, and this is something where um, this image is going to be better than the native image element, it's going to have support for aspect ratios. Nice. So we're going to—I mean, you can do it with the native. You're like element. preemptive three questions from Twitter. You're nailing it. Bam! Impact. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to write like 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 a tiny bit of a backend. So I'm going to bring the sidebar back real quick to create a new file, which is going to be no, not in here, down here, there. I'm going to write a little back end, and we're going to be using some Express, because whenever I do nodes, I just use Express because it's easy. And we're going to kill our Python web server and instead start our new server. Are you going right. to do some server-side rendering, you it's would say? It's so going to be server-side server -side rendering. Nice. Okay. I'm here all day. So we create a new app, and that app, hang on, that app uses the Express static middleware because mostly we're just going to do static page delivery and app.listen on 8080. And so now everything should be working the same. Cool. It's still loading. Now we're using our new backend. And now we're going to do something new because we're going to define our own route for HTML files request, response. And what I want to do in here is basically inspect our images to figure out what their aspect ratio is and do some CSS hackery to give the elements an aspect ratio so that they re re retain their aspect ratio even if the image data has not been loaded yet. And to do that, we have to first figure out which file is actually being loaded. So let's do the file path, which is request URL. And if the file path ends with a slash, that usually means that we have to at index.html, right? Because Amazing. if you have a slash, it's a folder and that kind of deal. Um, and now we have to do to read the file, basically. And to do that, you have to do the FS module. I'm going to use, I'm on node 8, 
so I can use all the new shiny stuff. So I can use the new promiseify function from the utils module to turn the old callback version of file system into a promise version. And we all like promises, so I'm going to do that. Hey, hey Google Home, do you, do you like promises? Oh, Chrome Home, sorry. Do you like promises? Uh, yeah. I prefer streams, though. <laughs> <laughs> Nerd. All right, so it's pretty simple. You just pass in a function that that has the standard node callback, ver callback layout, where the last parameter is a callback with error and result, and it turns it into something that, is a, that now is a function that returns a promise. And that means that we turn this whole thing into an async function and can now do uh, const. So if you're going to read the buffer, we can do await read file, file path. This is not going to work because we have to add um, static. Uh, then we can turn it into a string, so we can send it back. And then we can send these contents back. Let's hope that works. Still working. Cool. So now we can read files the way which I think is much nicer to read than having like either promises or callbacks, honestly. Async away really makes this code much easier. All right, we have the buffer, we have the content, and now we're going to do some post-processing on it because we need to figure out which images are being loaded, load all these images, and then figure out what the aspect ratio is. Mm -hmm. So we are going to do, because, and I know you're going to love this, we're going to do some regex magic. Oh, God. So what some people don't know, split actually. For the record, I haven't seen this code before, so I'm getting like anxiety every time he says these words. Like, we're going to do some regex magic. Do you want to write the regex? No. No, OK. Um, Going to answer some questions, though, while you type your regex, because nobody needs no, to know gonna what you're doing. I'm going to explain the regex. So oh. go for the questions, and then I'm okay. going to do the regex. One of the questions is, why aren't we extending the image element with is equals? Because that's not a thing. That is not a thing, unfortunately. So is equals is one of the battles we lost a little bit for custom elements. And I mean, it's, it's not, in the spec. It's, it's in the spec, but it's not actually implemented everywhere. Not even yeah. Chrome, I think, has it for the no, V1 we don't. spec. So it doesn't actually work anywhere. The polyfills don't have it. So you can use is equals all you want. It's not going to do anything Some right now. Some browsers have expressed very strong dislike of the is pattern. And if one browser <coughs> doesn't do it, there's no point so yeah. far at least in just doing it in so. some browsers because it's also very hard to polyfill. I don't even think it's polyfillable at all. Not sure about that. But it's for now, we have to live without subtyping native elements. We can only do HTML elements and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Carry right. on. Let's so what I'm going to do, we're going to write a regex, and we're going to find all the SC image elements. And we're going to do this. So we oh. want to have everything until the closing tag. Come on. SC image. It's beautiful, isn't it? And let's keep it this way, and let's call join down here. And let's work on the source for a bit so we can see what is going on. This means it is not working. So that's good. Um, we're splitting this. That is correct. Thank you very much. And my images disappeared, which is actually true because I need to put parentheses around this. So now this should look the same. Nice. The good part is that now new con is an array, and it's either going to be remainder code or it's going to be just one isolated SC image element. I can just to show what I'm talking about. I'm going to console log new content for a bit. I'm going to refresh, and then in the console, it's an array, and every second element now is an SC image element because that is the part that matches the regex, and everything that doesn't match is going to be put in another element. So we now just split apart our entire document into what is an SC image and what is not an SC image. And now we can do post processing on that. So what we're going to do next is we're going to remove the semicolon, and we're going to map. And each of these items is if the item starts with SC image. Actually, when it doesn't start with SC image, we don't, don't want to do anything because we don't care about it. So we're just going to return it. And otherwise, we want to figure out what the actual source attribute is. So again, we're going to do regex because oh my goodness. that's how I roll. Uh, na, 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 na. There's parentheses around this and that. And then we're going to do an exec on the item. And then we're going to return something. Let me think for a bit. Let me just do a test. I'm going to return the source just to see how it works. So now we, own, we, now we know the source actually has only the value of the source attribute. So that's good. It's probably got to read that file. Um, 
And now we're going to do, gonna do the item. Actually, no. The item can actually stay. What we want to do now next is we want to actually figure out what the aspect ratio of the image is. And this is where it gets, uh, we go into a little of the weeds of the Node ecosystem because now we have to look into image processing libraries. I just Googled a bit and took the first one I found, which is called uh, Graphics Magic, with, for short, GM. And we can subclass it to use Image Magic because that's the only one I've installed on my system. Don't worry too much about it. Basically, all the image processing libraries can do what I want, resize images and figure out what the size of an image is. And what I'm going to do down here, I'm going to load the image. And that's fairly easy with this library. So I'm just going to do static plus source. And let's just do a console log to see if that worked. I hope it will. So this should all look the same. Looking good. We have loaded an image. Size function. Now, this is where things are a little bit weird, because the library, as all node libraries, are a little bit old and have callbacks. But the cool thing is, Promisify, the function I loaded from node 8, actually works on libraries as well. As long as you've conformed to the standard callback pattern that node has, this is going to work. So I'm going to call image.sizeBindImage. So I pass in a function. It's going to turn that function into a promise version. And then I can do with height await size func. Why are you doing all this awaiting? Because Why don't you do it sync? Because the library is not sync. That's, 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 that's how callbacks work. So this is going to, ooh. If you would have oh. done it sync, it would have been fine. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I use, I'm using a wait inside the map callback, which is not an async function. So I'm just going to make it an async function. And for that to work, I also have to do a promise.all, because now all the array elements are going to be uh, pr promise values. There we go. So this should work again. Cool. Cool. So we see we have four images on our page, and we have four widths and heights. Magic. That's why it's called image, image magic, because magic. you just do some code invocation. At some point, you get what you actually want. Now we have to, now, now we talk about something that I really like, the uh, animations. Are no. you going to do some animations? No, not, not mm. yet. I'm going to talk about the aspect ratio hack in CSS. Ooh, we, can, we can ask Google. We can ask, we can ask. Go for it. Maybe I'll understand oh. you. <clears throat> Accent down. Hey, Chrome Home. Bleep. How does the aspect ratio hack in CSS work? Uh, Summer, I hate you. Um, <laughs> so the, you have an element, and it has another element or pseudo element inside it that has a padding top. Uh, that is the aspect ratio that you want. And then within inside it, you can use absolute positioning to keep something the same size. Uh, Everybody totally got that. That was well explained. I'm hoping the code will, <laughs> will now actually show what, what, how this works. So the weird thing is, when you define a padding top a percent in percentages, so padding top 50%, that 50% is not the height, but the width of the parent element. Don't ask me why, but that's how it works. And the cool thing about that is that we can say, here, actually, I should be using a temp attack. That this, we can abuse this, basically, to define an aspect ratio. Because what we're going to do is we're going to do height divided by width times 100 in percent. And that means the wider the image is, it will grow in height as well, because padding top is proportional to the width, and not of the height. This hack is also really good for iframes whenever you're loading like a YouTube video that you're importing, and it's always a weird so, aspect ratio. Do this. So, do so, this for everything. So, so just to show that this is actually working, I'm, gonna, I'm replacing the closing characters of the elements to inject some styles, which I actually And the closing. Yeah. Yes, like this. Let's take a look at this. OK, so you can see we have injected percentages successfully. So let's look at the actual visual version. Not quite what I was going for, but we can probably fix that with some styles. So we're going to do position relative. And so the problem right now is that we have a padding on these elements. And the contents of the shadow are being pushed down by the padding, which is not what we want. So we're going to just absolutely position the, the shadow DOM image inside at the top and at the left so it doesn't really care. What? 
Oh, I think I wrote it too fast. There we go. And because we can't really see it, I'm going to slow down the network, which, where is it? Is it down here somewhere? There it is, network conditions. So let's do it on slow, fast 3G. I think it should be good enough. So you can see the rectangle is there, even though the image is not loaded. And once it's there, it just replaces the right rectangle, which is still underneath there technically. But now we have images that consume the space the image will need once it's loaded. And that's something the native image tag doesn't do. Does not. I mean, you can use the same tag on the native image element. You can just define a padding top. But I thought that this was a really neat trick to show off. And this is how you don't have like, your, your stuff just jumping around whenever that your images come in. That is the best part. If someone loads the page at the bottom for some reason and scrolls upwards, stuff is not going to jump around because the images already allocate the space that they need. The only thing I dislike about this is that they kind of like the red square. The red's annoying, yeah. Yeah, so. I'm going to steal a question, though, first. Go for it. Um, the question was, what does the host selector does? Oh, that's a good question. And that is, I'm going to take that one. Go for it. Um, it basically lets you style the custom element itself. So if you think of a custom element, it has basically like its shell of a custom element. And host is that element itself, not the things inside of it. And something you can do, fair warning, is if I had written it like, oh, actually, I should have put it down here. Something like this wouldn't work, I think, because you cannot really, would this has worked? That definitely works, yes. So it's a function, I guess. Not, yeah. not, not a, it's like a pseudo. Not, not a matcher in the classical sense. So that's something to look out for. It also can't go down multiple children, I think, only top level children. It's a little bit iffy, but we have good documentation on uh, developers.google.com slash web, which you should totally go to mm -hmm. and read up on this. Um, and yeah, as I said, these red squares are a little bit sad. So what I'm going to do instead, I thought, uh, we could also do an animation. No, not mm. yet. But mm. maybe later. May maybe I'll humor you. Not you're, sure. You're, you're not a one-trick pony. <laughs> I thought I would do the medium bit, Ooh. where they have the blurred version like of a, the Like a low-res base 64 image background from tw Twitter suggestion? Do you think we should do this, oh, Twitter suggestion? Oh, someone has been thinking <laughs> along. I like it. That is exactly what I'm going to do. So we are going to generate a thumb. And because, the, as I said, the library is async, we have to create a new promiseify function again. So I'm going to call resize dot to buffer dot bind to the image, because otherwise it doesn't work. And then our thumb will be the thumb, thumb funk. How do you say think? thumb in German? Chrome Home? Hey, Chrome Home, how do you say thumb, thumb in German? Ein thumb. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually daumen, but that's all right. So I thought I would do a, a thumb size, because we can probably play around with the resolution a little bit. So I'm just going to put it here. Thumb size is going to go with 8, because that seems reasonable. Uh, thumb is now the image buffer. Actually, that's not true. Or is it? That is something that needs to go here, if I remember correctly. And here we need to say PNG. There we go. Do you uh, have all your brackets? Do you need an extra bracket? I think so. I think I'm good. Okay. It's not, not complaining. And so our thumb URL, all we're going to do is we're going to encode the thumb version as you already hinted at, as a base64 inline URL. Because we don't want to wait for the network to load a low res version so we can then show the high res version. So we're just going to put it inline into the document right away. So when the HTML arrives, we have something on screen, which I think is a much better experience. So the thumb. Somebody on Twitter wants me to do the animation stuff. You guys, I don't know how to animate anything. Like a transform is too hard for me. I'm really shit at We're CSS. going to do much transform today, I think. Yeah, yes. I know. To string, and luckily, Node, in contrast to the web, has just to base 64, which is really convenient. Nice. And what we're going to do here is we're going to do, say, our background URL, background image is a URL. And in here, we're going to do thumb URL. Boom. This looks about right, I think. I'm still on the slow network, so we can actually see the loading pattern, or I am actually did a mistake. I probably did a mistake. Thumb URL is not defined. Why not? But it's right here. Oh, that is, it should just be thumb. thumb. Thank you. 
a Zehenhagel. Zehenhagel? <laughs> that wasn't quite what I was hoping for. I think it's actually correct because it's just an 8x8 image tiled all over the place, but that's not the visual we were looking for. Gotta stretch that out. Yeah. Gotta stretch it out. So what I'm gonna do in the inherent styles, I'm gonna say background size is 100%, 100%. <gasps> cool. Yes. Cool. Yes. So we are on fast view. This is pretty good. But now, now, your moment. What could we do next? I'm going to answer a question from Twitter. OK. Um, one of the questions was, why didn't you just distribute an image as a slot in here? And that would be annoying, wouldn't it? For every image that you want on your yeah, screen. Yeah, also that wouldn't be framework compatible, because mm -hmm. then if you, whenever you have something like VDOM, it will just eliminate the image out mm -hmm. of my transfer. In general, it is, not, it is rarely advisable to just sprout new children into a custom element dynamically. No, but like you could have had like, you know, the SE image, and then you would also put you as the page oh. author, put your image in there. That's just annoying. You're writing the image twice. Yeah, no. I like this better. Yeah, just do it as a child. To be fair, that would work as well. It's, yeah. But I feel like it would be more work for I would copy paste it twice. Like, it'd yeah. be like SE image, and then an image, and then an SE image, and then an image. OK, so I'm going to ask you again. Mm -hmm. What could we do next? Put on your hat and get a clap out of yes. people? I genuinely don't know the answer because to I this question. Because I think people might, might not be quite awake. It still works. Trick them. All right. OK, so I'm going to ask you, what are we going to do next? But well, this is your moment. We can do some animation. We can do some animations. And actually, it's going to be super, super easy. Because I've, the, the thing that annoys me a little bit is you have this nice blurred version. And it's going to be like, pew. Uh, that could be a little bit nicer. Are you going to do a transform over there? No. Damn it. You're wrong. So what I'm going to do instead is we are just going to You guys, there's a fight on Twitter about how to properly translate thumb and thumbnail, for the record. Ooh. The, I'm going to get in on that later. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to define a keyframe animation, which goes from opacity 0, and that's it. <gasps> because it's what like does it go to? Nobody knows. Ah. So I'm going to put this on the image. And the nice thing about this is that this way, the browser will know it's an animation. We'll do the whole promotion to its own layer and make it fast, and then, and then, and then. And if you're writing production code, you'll put all the other vendor prefixes for keyframes and all that Well, you jazz. have tools for that, right? Like, I don't cool. write those by hand, but. I do. I, like we, an don't, we, have, we have forgotten the most important thing about Supercharged. This is not production-ready code. Don't copy it. We never it. do production-ready code at Supercharged. This is about concepts and, you know, like, things you can do on the web. But you shouldn't be copy-pasting this. There's, we didn't do accessibility. We, um, did, a, we did not do accessibility. I, I didn't like, reflect all my properties correctly. Mm -hmm. I only have getters and no setters, which is also not nice. We're not even handling if you change the source on an element. Or if you're like, scrolling really fast and you're creating children a lot. Yeah, let's. No. So I'm, I wanted to show you how it can be acceptably easy to load dynamics images lazy and have a nice transition on it, not to have an element that you can use everywhere. But still, I think the concept is pretty interesting. So the, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put an anim animation duration of five seconds on it, mostly because I want to see the thing happening, not because five seconds is a good value here. Um, but this should be enough to actually have the image just fade in, because by default, the opacity default value is one. So that's why I could leave out the two, because it's just going to transition to the default value. And secondly, animations don't loop by default. So I don't have to worry about the fade going over, over, over. it's just going to fade to the end position and stop there. So hopefully, we're going to see a blurred image. It's going to load, and then it's going to <gasps> fade in. Right? And we scroll down. We can actually do the throttling now, because we don't want to wait that long. We see the next image, and it's going to fade in. And that, I think, wow. makes a much nicer experience. That's wonderful. It? And just because we have a couple of minutes left, I'm just going to show you one thing. If you're more into the pixelated look, one property is all it takes. And I'm wrong. Sermageddon, what is it? <laughs> there you go. And that's something when you like increase the resolution a little bit on the thumbnails. Let's go to 16 by 16, because why not? Um, you can actually see the patterns already emerging a little bit, which also can be a really nice look. Um, and I think I'm going to stop here. 
I'm going to push this code up on GitHub as we always do. It's on github.com slash Google Chrome slash UI element samples. But we're also going to put it in the description on the video. Yeah. Um, thanks, everyone, so much for watching this, for bearing with me through all the weird phases of this. That's uh, beautiful. Thank, thank you for handling the Twitter and confusing the heck out of me and using me the ha making me use the hat twice. Thank you for clapping along. Could have been third times. And uh, if you have any questions, ask me on Twitter later, or I'll be around a little bit more. Thank you.